Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, the Olympics. Every four years, this mass gathering event brings athletes and spectators together from all over the globe. Planning begins months and even years prior, and public health security is a major consideration. Lucia Mullen, an associate scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an expert in preparedness and response, joins the podcast to talk about working with the International Olympic Committee and the WHO and thinking through everything from protests to infectious disease outbreaks at one of the world's largest sporting events. Events. Let's listen. Lucia Mullen, thank you so much for joining us on Public Health on Call. Today we are talking about the Paris Olympics. And can you tell us a little bit about what public health might have to do with the Paris Olympics? Yes, thank you for having me, Lindsay. So the Paris Olympics or any Olympic game is what we often refer to as a mass gathering. Uh, This is where a large number of people are brought together, usually to one geographic space for a certain period of time and often in a high density area. So there's going to be a lot of people coming together. This brings a lot of health risks. Uh, You've got, of course, the infectious disease component of it, especially because we have that global travel component connected to events like the Olympics, where we're having people travel from all over the world. We've got over 200 countries participating in the Olympics as athletes, and then we're going to have even more coming as spectators. Um, so any type of infectious disease, we've, we've all been through COVID recently, we know there's a heightened risk if we're bringing a lot of people together. Uh, we also have a couple other uh, concerns. So one is weather related. Um, it's it's the summer. We are dealing with climate change, which means we're dealing with hotter hotter uh, summers as well, especially in Europe. Um, and when we're having athletes competing out in many outside events at extremely high levels of athleticism, we're going to have some worries about overheating. A couple other things might be uh, even related to security aspects. So the Olympics are watched by millions of people, billions of people around the world. Um, and with that, there are some heightened security risk from protests uh, just because it gives them that international platform all the way to terror attacks. We've had a couple previous Olympics that have had some terror attacks related to it. So there's a range of different risks that we need to consider in the planning phase for such events. And this is often where the health sector will start becoming involved with other sectors of the government and event organizers to first identify what those risks are and then figure out plans to try and mitigate them. So they would bring someone like you, in fact, you, to one of these meetings. What what does that look like? I, I should say, especially for something like the Olympics, it happens very regularly. We know exactly when it's going to happen. We also know where it's going to happen. Um, planning starts years and years in advance. Uh, we also have the benefit of having previous games. And so we try and highlight game to game learning. So we'll often start with discussions that are facilitated by the IOC, which is the International Olympic Committee. They will come together with the host country and start providing platforms to bring in different uh, experts, uh, different um organizations. So we've we've got WHO that's going to be involved from the international aspect. We'll always have the health government agency involved, what, whatever their national health authority is. And then we'll have outside consultants and other experts that are often pulled on to provide technical expertise in, in certain areas and um, either start it as a casual conversation to go through what needs to be done and and what the current baseline is. And this is usually where risk assessments will happen, which starts that process of trying to identify what the risks are that we're most concerned about so we can figure out how we can start countering them. So let's talk about one of those risks that you looked at, and and maybe you could explain a little bit about your role specifically with uh, the Paris Olympics. Will do. So I am a member of the WHO uh, Collaborating Center for Global Health Security. This is something that the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security is. And as part of that, we are a member of their mass gathering expert group. So we often come in as 
representatives of this wider group um, to talk through what might be needed for events or to discuss uh, other opportunities that event organizers might want post events. So this is also how we worked with the International Olympic Committee to do a, an in-depth evaluation of both the Tokyo 2020 and the Beijing 2022 Games to try and figure out if there's any challenges that we observed and any lessons identified that we can hopefully learn from for future games and what recommendations we might want to push forward for future games. Both it might be COVID specific, as we all know it's still ongoing, but more importantly, uh, recommendations that are broader and could address an array of risks past COVID. Well, let's talk about COVID because I don't know if you can hear it in my voice right now. I'm actually on the, the back end of a bout of COVID. Uh, it is out there. We are seeing surges in a lot of different places. There is a, a brand new variant. So let's talk about COVID specifically. What what? How do you manage COVID with the Olympics? That's a great question and very sorry you're suffering from COVID. <laughs> so I guess it it depends how you want to look at it. Obviously, what was done for both Tokyo 2020 and Beijing 2022 was in the height of the pandemic. Um, it was also in two countries that hadn't historically seen a lot of COVID. So we were also worried about naive populations there. And it was when the vaccines, especially during Tokyo, weren't as widely available. So it was a much bigger concern and we were very worried about the risks of COVID to the general population and unduly putting strain on the host population in terms of filling up their hospitals and all of that um, because of hosting this event, as well as risking the athletes' health and safety. First of all, for, for their own livelihoods, but secondly, because if, if you're going to be sick, then the chances of you being able to compete at that level are diminishing. So there was a dual balance there of trying to make sure that they were as healthy as possible to not risk spreading it to others, as well as healthy as possible so that they could compete at their best level. So for Tokyo and Beijing, our focus was very much on reducing the amount of spread of COVID, both within the Olympic villages and therefore within the, the Olympic participants, as well as from the Olympics to the local participants. Now we're in a different stage. We don't have anywhere near, if at all, different regulations from countries in terms of testing and in terms of mask use. We've seen all of those government restrictions lifted. So this is a very different situation than those two games. We are expecting to see cases of COVID, but we're going to see them similarly to how we'd expect to see cases of other respiratory diseases that are often prevalent during these games. So there's going to be a lot of attention on encouraging the traditional public health measures keeping your distance if you're feeling unwell, a lot of hand washing, uh, a lot of reporting to the local clinics to, to get checked if you think you might have been um, exposed. But there isn't going to be anywhere near as much attention on the COVID-19 mitigation measures as we saw in Tokyo and Beijing. So let's talk about one of the other uh, possibilities you mentioned. You, know, you have a lot of people gathering in a very public space, and so public safety is obviously at the forefront. What might a preparedness expert like yourself think about in that instance? So for the safety side of things, we've got a couple of things. You've obviously got the uh, occupational safety, and, and this is what we often see in many types of venues, even if you think to regular football or basketball games in, in big venues that are, are able to take hundreds of thousands of participants, we've got to worry about crowd control. We've got to make sure there are enough entrances and exits. There's enough people monitoring to make sure that panic doesn't set out in the crowd, which could cause issues like stampedes and, and that type of thing. Now, stuff I'd say with the Olympics, that's something that they've monitored for years and years and are very, very strong at making sure that there's enough mitigation measures in there. Similarly with, with most of these events, if we think about it with, with Paris as well, a lot of the venues that they're using are actually already standing venues. Um, so it's stuff that they have these protocols in place and they've also tested them. Part of the Olympic prep for this is they'll often do a uh, what they call test events. So in the couple years lead up to the games, they'll choose a couple different sporting events to run some of these operations, run these protocols with similar types of numbers in terms of spectators, in terms of athletes, to make sure that those protocols are up to date and are run 
properly. Uh, this also allows for opportunities of training of the various staff members themselves. The other side of it that is harder to run as a test event, I guess I should say, is the CBRN or the, the terrorism side of it. Now, this is a very low risk of it happening, but because it has that international platform, it could be a, a high consequence event. So with that, they will have a lot of surveillance systems in place. And this is why they work very closely with the intelligence sector, with the law enforcement sector. And a lot of that training is handed over to them. And again, there are some opportunities where this is um, able to have almost test runs. So if we look at Paris itself, Itself. Well, France last year and in, in the previous couple of years has had major events. They had the Rugby World Cup. It may not have seen the same number of people as we're expecting for the Olympics. We are expecting to have over 10 million people enter Paris or, or enter France for the Olympics. But we were able to see large numbers of people come together and something that was a very high, highly visible event. So there are lots of opportunities like that. And this is where there's a lot of heightened security that goes into it. The surveillance that starts running up months before the event and full, and keeps going throughout the entirety of the event really help bring down the risk of such things from happening. You mentioned, you know, partnering with law enforcement and other agencies. Who else might be at the table for some of these conversations about preparedness? Oh, it's very much a multi-sectoral effort. So if we're looking at the ministry or government side of things, we may also have Ministry of Foreign Affairs, especially with that international component. You could have the Ministry of Interior as well. Um, we'll often have education and sports in there. And you could also have just uh, a, a lot of different private sector NGOs who have all been involved either from building venues to you know, having consultants that help run them to staffing of the venues, you're, you're going to have a lot of the food sector in there. If you think about it, often when we go to such events, we're always going to have food and, and uh, drinks being sold as well. So need to consider that side of it. You're also going to have all of the medical component as well. So not just the public health side, but we're going to be dealing with hospitals and, and make sure that all of the first responders are, are available and have worked together and know, all know each other as well. So that if some Something should happen, we're able to react cohesively. Can you tell me about the role that, you know, communication plays in all of this? Because, you know, it sounds like there's a great deal of preparation. There's a lot of communication between all these different parties. What about with maybe the people who are attending or with the people who are sitting at home watching? Is there is that part of this as well? Yes. And it's very multifaceted as well. If you can remember from previous Olympic Games, we'll have a lot of media representatives from different countries come to, to kind of give coverage for their own countries at the Games and, and also discuss with the local population and, and other groups while they're there. There is a lot that goes on before the Games in terms of awareness raising, in terms of using this as opportunities to promote different protocols that might be in place to promote safe practices. There is also, with that, a lot of work that goes into assuaging fears. And with that, we're having a lot of opportunities of misinformation or of just rumors circulating and they're coming out quickly. They're coming out regularly. This, again, is not a new phenomenon. We've seen that with prior Olympic Games um, going all the way back to 2012 is a great example of the Olympic Games in London when there was issues that started circulating about killer caterpillars out of all things for the event. So there needs to be a lot of focus, both from the event organizers and their close relationships with the different media personnel of addressing concerns as they arise, notifying which ones need to be quickly addressed, which ones are just rumors that they're expected to happen, and then can kind of continue as business as usual, and which ones need to be monitored that could be potential signs for other risks, such as having a, an increased population that's starting to get worried about something and, and starting to get swept up into this frenzy. I do want to ask you about one more specific situation where there are rumors circulating, and that's around the possibility of people getting dengue. Could you speak to that? Uh, yes, can do. So if we think about dengue, we know it's a vector-borne disease. It's spread by mosquitoes. Traditionally, these types of mosquitoes are not in Europe. 
In recent years, due to climate change, due to increased global travel, we are seeing more and more of these mosquitoes in Europe. And there has been, in the past couple years, records of more of them in France. So there has been a lot of attention already paid to dengue control. Right now, France, and, and for quite a while, has been increasing their surveillance efforts. They've been doing lots of traps to try and monitor how many of these mosquitoes are around and also start putting in some vector control measures to kill off the, the mosquitoes. They're also embedding it into some of their surveillance measures. So if we do start having cases of, of dengue, we will notice it. This is one of those issues that it is present, but it's something that's already been accounted for and it's already working towards ways to uh, counteract it. And that's also including some of that risk communication methods they are providing to the general public and also to the incoming travelers and, and participants that would be attending as spectators, different awareness raising tidbits and facts about dengue, about how to prevent dengue, about mosquito control measures themselves. So it is something that is on the landscape of, of one of our risks, but it's not as near alarming as I should say a lot of media is, is making it out to be. Could you tell us a little bit more about, you mentioned that you're in the in the process of kind of doing a debrief on the last two Olympics. Could you tell us, you know, maybe give us an example of how that's informing the Paris Olympics, something that you've learned from that or something that maybe didn't go according to plan? Yeah, certainly. So we did a deep dive on the Tokyo 2020 and Beijing 2022 Olympic Games. Now, this was largely focused on their efforts to minimize COVID-19 spread, but we really wanted to look at how some of those learnings could expand beyond the pandemic. Um, so some of the parts of this included looking at how they were able to effectively communicate the different protocols. And again, if we can remember back to Tokyo 2020, we call it the Tokyo 2020 Games. They actually occurred one year later. They were postponed. This is the first time in history an Olympic game has been postponed for a health reason, and they occurred in, in the summer of 2021. This was to give the event organizers, the country, more time to understand the pandemic, more time to understand the effectiveness of different measures that were coming out, as well as different therapeutics, you know, different tests, and of course, then different vaccines to effectively counter COVID-19 and be able to confidently feel that they could host the games in a safe way. So part of this included creating and continuously updating the public health protocols. Now, they refer to these as the playbooks. And even down to that name itself was thought about how it could be something that could be effectively communicated to all of the athletes and other participants coming into the country and something that would resonate well with them. It started off with, you know, should we call it the rule books? And it felt that playbooks would connect better with athletes because that's something that they're used to in a lot of their training. Uh, this was also a one-stop shop. It had all of the protocols. So in terms of effective communication tools, just that in of itself was an incredibly successful communication tool and helped us realize that if we are going to have another major event during an Olympic game, Ensuring that we have something like that that is so overarching that can address the variety of different audience members it needs to, that will continuously be the one place they can go to, they can refer to, will already help us halfway there in knowing that not only do the athletes and other participants know what they should do, but it's something they can continuously go back to double check. Another prime example from these lessons learned was the effectiveness of that uh, kind of basic hand hygiene and, and personal hygiene I'd mentioned earlier. So an interesting tidbit from this evaluation we found is it while being very, very successful in limiting COVID-19 spread, and I should have said that first and foremost, it, it did very much show that the uh, protocols were very effective. It also helped limit other diseases, especially other respiratory diseases, as well as other gastrointestinal diseases. So this allowed athletes with the opportunity to be able to compete without having to worry about things like norovirus. And this is something that we would normally expect to see a fairly high level of during Olympic Games, because again, we're bringing together a whole bunch of people from all over the world. We're putting them in one Olympic village. They're interacting very regularly with each other. So just having a lot of 
extra pamphlets around, a lot of hand hygiene stations, really trying to push that mentality had helped buy down that risk. And, and that was something that we felt was a, a very much a simple measure that we could continue to try and push at further events. I think the final thing is the importance of surveillance. And surveillance is certainly not new. Uh, it, it also wasn't new to Tokyo or Beijing. It may, to, it may have been the most in-depth surveillance we've done um, on the amount of testing and reviewing of COVID-19 cases. But we have used surveillance especially different enhanced surveillance systems at other games. And it can help us confidently know when something's happening, where it's happening, in order to quickly stop it. And, and I think that is one of the most important things going forward. If we can start putting in wider surveillance systems, then we can help buy down the risk for some other diseases as well. Well, Professor Mullen, it is very, very interesting to know that so much work has been going on for so many years behind these big events. Thank you so much for your time, and we're, we're just so happy to hear from you. Well, thank you very much. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace fernandez Ciciri. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production management by Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace fernandez Ciciri. Analytics by Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send us an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.